too loud? We're okay? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Henrik. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's good to be back in Southeast Asia. Um, I, the last time I was in Vietnam was in 1992, so it's, it's nice to, uh, to be back and, and see the, the changes that have uh, taken place over uh, too long a period. Um, so, um, right, so I'm, I'm here talking about um, uh, agricultural uh, productivity at the agricultural sector and the non-farm uh, economy in, uh, in Ethiopia um, and uh, the experiences that, um, that have taken place there in the past uh, 10, 20 years. Um, and uh, so let me just uh, start by just giving you an overview of my story uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, the idea here is that uh, Ethiopia has experienced um, some strong economic changes. Uh, growth, in particular, uh, has been quite impressive, and a, a changing uh, economic landscape. Um, and uh, the reforms that have taken place uh, since 1991 with the fall of the, uh, of the DERG um, have uh, been based largely on uh, agricultural-led uh, development-led uh, industrialization strategy. Right? Um, but I'm, I want to focus uh, in particular here on, uh, on the non-farm economy um, and uh, want to stress that the non-farm economy is important in terms of employment and uh, in, in terms of income, but uh, it is neglected in policy circles, as Henrik uh, had, uh, had alluded to. Um, and we'll um, conclude that, well, you know, um, perhaps this neglect is benign, but for the time being, right? Uh, and so we'll, let's uh, see what we mean by that. Uh, as we proceed. So uh, just to, to give you a sense of, uh, of the structure of, uh, of uh, GDP in Ethiopia and uh, what the changes that have taken place in the past, uh, ten, past decade or so, um, pretty standard for uh, uh, an African economy, right? So you have uh, large employment in agriculture. So agriculture is the main uh, employer and mostly smallholder agriculture, but uh, low productivity. Right, so uh, about 50% of, of GDP uh, is, uh, is made up of uh, agricultural production, but 85% of, uh, of employment. Uh, now services, on the other hand, uh, are a smaller portion of employment, but make up um, a larger percent uh, of GDP. Um, this is where um, I think kind of the, the remarkable story for Ethiopia is in, in the African setting is, uh, is the high uh, growth rates that are experienced there. Now I should caution that uh, there, uh, there is some skepticism about these, uh, about these numbers uh, for Ethiopia and uh, there's been quite a bit written about, uh, uh, about the numbers that come out of uh, the Central Statistical Agency. Um, but um, what we see here, uh, according to the official figures, is uh, between 2000 and 2012, uh, an overall growth rate of 9.4% uh, per year. Uh, quite remarkable. Um, the, oops, excuse me, the uh, service sector driving a lot of this, but in agriculture, uh, uh, we see 7% growth per year. Okay, even, even if we don't believe those numbers, uh, if you uh, look on the ground, we do see uh, things going on. Uh, we do see changes taking place uh, in uh, the agricultural sector uh, in Ethiopia from various different measures. Um, and so what we, we are seeing growth, we are seeing uh, changes in the uh, economic landscape. The precise numbers are, are kind of hard to pin down. Um, so uh, here's an example of uh, the uh, changes that we're seeing in the, in the rural sector. So this is based on uh, work that Tasu Waldahana and I have done with uh, Wider's Growth and, and Poverty Project, um, where uh, we've uh, constructed these uh, poverty incidence curves, really the cumulative distribution of uh, per capita household consumption from uh, three uh, household survey years. Um, and uh, what we see here is, uh, right, the, the black line, uh, the vertical black line is the poverty line. Uh, the, uh, the narrow or the thin uh, black distribution line is for uh, 2000, and uh, the blue one is for 2005. And here we see some moderate uh, growth um, uh, throughout the distribution in rural areas. In urban areas, we saw uh, uh, much larger growth, but I'm focusing on the rural sector here. Um, but then between 2005 and 2010, we've seen uh, r considerable growth uh, and across the board with the exception of the poorest 10% of the population. 
uh, in, in rural areas. Um, and this is consistent with other, for other data that we see in terms of non-monetary uh, measures of welfare and, and the like. So we're seeing uh, considerable changes in, uh, in well-being in, um, in Ethiopia. Um, and so now, let's, let's, um, now that we've seen the structure, let's think about what has happened um, since 1991. Um, and uh, this was, in 1991 was when uh, the uh, Derg uh, government of Mengistu was overthrown um, and um, policy reforms were, uh, were implemented uh, that uh, introduced a market-oriented uh, approach. Yet, I should be very clear, the government maintained strong control, right? So uh, a market within, uh, within confined bounds. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about some of those bounds. Um, and as I said before, the, the driving force at the core of uh, this development strategy uh, is this agricultural development-led uh, industrialization strategy, with the idea here being that um, there's broad-based growth of uh, smallholder agriculture will not only um, uh, re result in uh, less food insecurity, uh, but will also um, lead to um, broader race growth in uh, smallholders, uh, but would also spur industrialization through forward and backward linkages. So forward linkages, uh, for example, through um, the production of a wage type foods or industrial uh, uh, products, and backward linkages um, through, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, backward linkages uh, through the, the demand for uh, fertilizers and the like. Um, now the reform experiences, um, it's focus, um, the focus has been on uh, agricultural production. And so let's just take a look at uh, and see what has happened. Um, so uh, in terms of production growth, we saw that there was uh, considerable production growth uh, from the previous slides. Um, and, but much, much of this uh, growth has been um, in the form of expansion of land, not so much uh, through agricultural productivity. Um, and, um, this is not terribly surprising given um, how little um, modern input use uh, is observed. But there is some evidence uh, that there are changes that are taking place uh, that lead to productivity gains. Right? Um, so for example, um, the expanded agricultural extension system. Currently, there are some 42,000 extension agents uh, in Ethiopia, uh, which it gives you about, um, on average, about three extension agents per uh, ward, per ward, which is the uh, highest number of uh, agricultural extension agents per farmer. Right. So, presumably, there is some uh, some uh, uh, dissemination of information uh, going on here. There's evidence of increased modern input use as well. Right. Um, most of this, in, in terms of seeds, most of this in the form of uh, mo modern varieties of, of maize. Uh, but in uh, a recent value chain study for TEF uh, that my co-author has done, um, we see that there's more use of, uh, of modern inputs for uh, modern seeds for TEF as well. Um, fertilizer use. Fertilizer use has doubled over um, the past decade. Um, and uh, yeah, if you think about where these uh, seeds and fertilizer come from, they come through uh, government uh, organized uh, cooperatives. So just keep in mind that the role of the government here uh, in providing those, uh, those inputs. Um, the focus of, of Adley has not just been on increasing agricultural productivity through extension through the use of modern inputs and the like, but uh, has also uh, focused on improving uh, the physical infrastructure. And the Ethiopian government has, has invested enormous sums of money um, in, uh, in uh, building up the physical infrastructure. And this is where we could think of, uh, think about uh, uh, Koshik's comment this morning about the macro effects of some of these, uh, some of these policies, which include uh, the, uh, the use of, of the financial system uh, and the, the uh, credit lack, the difficulty of uh, small scale farmers, small scale uh, enterprises having access to uh, credit because of, uh, of the use of of uh, that for uh, developing the, the physical infrastructure. But now let me just focus on the, uh, the outcome of this. And uh, starting with roads. Uh, starting in 1997, uh, the, the government has, uh, has uh, poured enormous resources into uh, improving 
and uh, expanding the, uh, the road network. So the major trunk uh, roads um, have uh, the length of all weather surface roads has um, more than doubled, or has doubled in 15 years and has more than doubled uh, since 1997 uh, to this date. Um, and most regional capitals are, uh, are connected to one another, which means that the wholesale markets in these, uh, in these regional capitals are connected, and this is, uh, I'll uh, talk a bit more about that in just a minute. Um, in terms of remoteness, uh, there's le less remoteness as well. So if we think of the uh, percentage of the population that's over five hours from the city, this has fallen from uh, 82% in 1997 with the start of the, of the road uh, building uh, project to 38% uh, in uh, 2007. Roads have not been the only uh, emphasis, but also um, electricity. The Ethiopian government has, uh, has uh, devoted resources as well to building hydroelectric dams. Um, and the construction that it was initiated prior to 2000 has resulted in uh, increasing generating capacity from um, seven watts per person to, uh, in 2000 to 21 uh, watts per person in 2010. And with uh, the government is, uh, is currently in the process of, of uh, building a dam, uh, damming the, the Blue Nile, the Grand Millennium Dam, uh, which would place uh, Ethiopia in a position to not only provide uh, electricity for, uh, for the domestic needs, but also uh, export uh, to Sudan, uh, Djibouti, and to Kenya. Uh, but this is uh, a sensitive issue, especially with the Egyptians and uh, uh, the downstream uh, countries, the Egyptians and, uh, and Sudanese. Um, so we'll see where that takes us. Uh, in terms of telecommunications as well, um, fixed uh, phone lines have uh, more than doubled uh, since 2000. Uh, but more impressively, mobile uh, subscriptions have risen from 50,000 in 2003 to 10 million uh, in 2011. All right, so quite remarkable changes. So what are the consequences of, of this in terms of uh, the rural sector, in terms of, uh, of the marketing of uh, production in, uh, in the rural sector? Uh, and this is where uh, so, uh, Bart Minton and I uh, did some work on um, interviewing traders and brokers and, and truckers in all of the major wholesale markets uh, in Ethiopia. Um, and uh, we found, um, among other things, uh, that um, these changes over the past decade have improved spatial uh, market integration or serial uh, of serial markets. Um, there's been a 50% reduction in uh, transportation costs between these wholesale markets, um, and uh, that marketing margins in these serial markets have fallen as there's been more competition. Right, um, and these uh, you see more competition and greater flows of uh, cereals through these uh, through these markets, um, and um, you know, here here are these some of the small scale traders are these uh, are some of the uh, the non farm workers that we're thinking about here. Now, um, in terms of policy and uh, the non farm sector. Um, the government has been explicit in its uh, in its. Um, PRSP or its, uh, its five-year plan, uh, the most recent of which is the Growth and Transformation Plan, that medium and small uh, scale enterprises are uh, central or an important part to rural development. Right? But even though that's noted explicitly, uh, implicitly it's treated as if um, the agricultural development is a prerequisite for any investment on the part of the government in the rural non-farm uh, enter uh, enterprises. Um, so the idea here is, well, the consequence of this is that the rural non-farm sector falls through the institutional gaps. Right? Um, on the side of, of the MSEs um, in the uh, Growth and Transformation Plan, the Ministry of Commerce, focus, uh, their entire focus is on urban MSEs. It's quite explicit that that's urban MSEs and all of the uh, follow-up has been uh, clear, it's been clear that that is where all the uh, emphasis has been, has been placed. Now for the, the ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, which is uh, arguably the, the one ministry that has the largest presence in rural areas, uh, its focus has been on agricultural productivity primarily. Right? Um, and so where does the rural non-farm uh, economy fall in there? It's, it's not covered uh, institutionally. 
Um, so let's just uh, take a minute to, uh, to uh, examine some of the characteristics of uh, non-farm employment. Um, and um, OK, thanks. Um, our best source of information uh, about the uh, non-farm sector is a rural investment climate uh, survey for, that the bank did back in 2006 and 7. though uh, recent household surveys are, uh, give a consistent picture with this. It's important for rural employment. 25% um, of, uh, of households report some form of non-farm uh, income. It's especially important for female-headed households, where 41% of female-headed households report some. Um, and only 3% of households report this as their sole source of income. So it's, it's um, agriculture remains the key uh, sector for, uh, for households, but the non-farm uh, sector is also important for some. Right? Um, and it's important in terms of uh, sources of rural incomes. Among those who report uh, some form of non-farm activity, uh, it, that activity makes up, on average, 42% of their income. Um, uh, and if we look at all households, um, looking at a household, uh, household survey, 17% um, of households in the poor, excuse me, 17% of household income in the poorest quintile is made up of, of non-farm uh, income on average among all households, and 13% for, uh, for those in the richest quintile. So what we're seeing here is that the non-farm sector is an important source of employment and income for disadvantaged households and for, uh, for female-headed households. Um, now in terms of the composition, it's not just manufacturing. In fact, it's not primarily manufacturing, it's services. And it's the small scale uh, enterprises. Uh, on average, 1.4 workers um, per enterprise. And 99% of, uh, of the enterprises have three or few workers. And they're uh, low earnings. Why do, what are the reasons for startups? Um, we have both push and pull factors. Um, you can see that those who, are, uh, who aren't able to produce as much because of lack of ac access to land, or uh, if, they, uh, if they have bad years in terms of agricultural production, they're pushed into uh, the non-farm sector. Um, the pull, on the pull side, this is, if you have a good year, right, then this gives you a, a, a means of using uh, the agricultural income that you have, that you have earned. Interestingly, um, Market opportunities are not, the, uh, are not one of the biggest draws. We see that this makes up a small percentage of the reasons why households started non-farm enterprises. So what we can see here is that there's this close relationship between agriculture and uh, the non-farm sector. Let me, let's just highlight uh, some of these very quickly here. First, um, agricultural production uh, affects demand for non-farm employment. Right? The local agricultural uh, uh, production does. Um, and um, the farm income is also a source of, uh, of non-farm investment. And uh, the non-farm uh, income is a source for, uh, for inputs into uh, farm production. So it goes both ways. I'm kind of going through this quickly. Um, and um, here's, uh, I'll skip this. Um, and non-farm labor activities are, uh, are seasonal and counter-cyclical uh, with agriculture. So the idea here is that um, the peak activity periods for the non-farm sector are during the slack demand periods in agriculture, and the low periods of activity are uh, in, during the planting and the harvesting period. So in other words, the non-farm uh, labor is, uh, uh, non-farm employment soaks up uh, the uh, labor when the opportunity cost of labor is low. And so effectively, the non-farm sector and the agricultural sector are, uh, are complements. Um, now, constraints to growth in the non-farm sector. On the supply side, uh, we have the investment climate, right? So where costs are high, so you have uh, cost of transportation, telecommunications, and, and the like. Um, on the demand side, um, we have limited uh, local demand that's related to agriculture. Right? And this gives us, uh, this follows from uh, markets being fragmented. Um, now, 
just let me speak briefly about uh, the political economy issues at play here uh, as we think about the, the, the role of policy in the non-farm uh, economy. Um, the government controls uh, the land and supply of agricultural inputs. Um, and uh, the government owns all land in, in uh, Ethiopia and um, leases this land out to, uh, to small-scale farmers or to, to anyone who uses the land. Um, and f so for smallholders, this, is, uh, this allows the government to maintain its, uh, its authority over the small-scale holders. Um, and in this context, uh, by maintaining this authority, the government can safely stimulate growth um, and uh, without worrying about, uh, as Laver says, the emergence of a class of large holders who might translate economic power into political power. On the non-farm side, it's not clear that the state has a similar mechanism to maintain its authority. Right? Um, and so it, it, this might be one reason why uh, we observe this, uh, this neglect on the part of the government of developing this sector. Um, now, hard to prove this, but there clearly is a palpable sense of mistrust of the private sector on the part of the government, and conversely, then the, the uh, private sector uh, uh, mistrust of the government on the part of the private sector. So it's within this context that, uh, that we are observing a, a, a neglect of the private sector. So, um, and also, uh, we need to think about what, what's going to happen uh, in the coming years once Meles has, has uh, passed away two years ago. Now, uh, my last slide, I promise. Um, so way forward. Now, um, this is where I, I think of, of Koshik's comment this morning. I, I wave the data and I say, therefore. All right, so this is speculative, right? So uh, I, should, I should make very clear that that's where we stand now. Um, so, the way forward is um, alleviating demand, uh, alleviating the demand constraints, right? For now, that makes uh, good sense uh, if we're thinking about the non-farm sector, right? So um, as, um, as Loning et al. Uh, point out that efforts to alleviate the supply, uh, the su supply side constraints might not have much of an impact if the binding constraint is on the demand side, right? So it makes sense to, uh, to stimulate agricultural uh, productivity now. But in doing so, we can also uh, approach um, the, both the agriculture and the non-farm economy through broad-based policies that, that benefit both of those. Um, and you know, you're kind of you're addressing uh, access to finance, transportation, and, and the like. And then finally, um, small towns uh, could be a, a, a good way to, uh, to bridge that link where the markets would, I wasn't able to uh, talk about it before, but the, the fragmented markets are largely due to uh, the, uh, all of the, the uh, well, tra uh, transportation costs and like, but uh, that farmers and traders report that their most important um, uh, buyers are in the local markets or in the neighborhood. All right, so if you develop, uh, develop more uh, small towns, then this could be a way of, uh, of providing the, the uh, greater demand uh, for agricultural production, which then benefits the uh, rural non-farm economy, but also the opportunities for uh, the non-farm uh, workers. So, thank you.